I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So before I begin my sermon this morning, um, one of the things that I would just like to say, um, this is a sermon in which I offer myself. I'm going to be rather vulnerable. Um, I keep hearing that when a priest is able to do that, it opens up possibility for conversation. This is a passage that I have wrestled with for a really, really long time. I think in part because I, in many ways, um, associate with this woman. So just know what I offer to you is born out of my heart, my pain, and my struggle. So lots of grace, please. If you have been around me long enough, you know that I am a mover and I am a walker. My body goes until it just doesn't. In fact, sitting and being stationary really isn't in my being. Over the years, my own spirituality has been expressed through movement and pilgriming. I find comfort and peace while I walk. I enjoy the cadence, the rhythm it sets for my mind and body, as well as the opportunity, as the poet Mary Oliver has suggested, to pay attention, to be astonished, and then go and tell someone. When you walk and you have eyes that are open, those three things are sure to happen. Walking has become my steady companion in life, and for what it's worth, I trust that when I walk, it is the most open posture for me to receive what God has to tell me. My eyes and my heart are open in ways that just aren't when I'm not. Well, oftentimes I have found in the walk of faith that sources of strength are certainly born or can be born out of pain. And that is no different for me and walking. When my second child, Noah, was just three, years, three weeks old, we were living in Austin in an old house in a historic section of Austin, and I was walking down the wooden stairs holding Noah, my newborn baby, while Luke, my two-year-old, was right at my side. I was postpartum, exhausted, and more than just a little sleep-deprived. All the makings for something not good to happen. And in a matter of just a few minutes, my feet slipped out from under me and I fell down the flight of wooden st stairs from the top all the way to the bottom. I mean, I fell. I hit every single hard step on the way down. And with each step, as I moved down, I could feel my body becoming more and more tense, trying hard, being desperate to not lose hold of my newborn baby. Well, we eventually reached the bottom, and I looked at Noah, who was still in my arms unscathed, and Luke, my two-year-old, was standing over me, staring. I was flat on my back, and immediately I felt pain like I had never known, ever. I fell so long and so hard, tightening in an unusual manner so as to keep my little guy from hitting the ground. And in so doing, I knew that I had done irreparable damage to my back. 
and all I knew to do was to cry out in pain. My eyes filled with tears, and I knew in that moment, I knew that pain would be a part of my life for the rest of my days, and how true those thoughts would come to be. Well, over the next few months, I was in the deepest agony I had ever been. The fall had really jacked my back up and created the dreaded nerve damage. And any of you guys who have that or have had it, you know what I'm talking about. It's the kind of damage and the kind of pain where you look fine on the outside, right? But on the inside, oh my gosh, it's terrible. It was unbearable. I was a young stay-at-home mom trying to care for my two children at the time, and I was living with pain that was more than I could bear. And at that particular time, it was chronic. It was unrelenting. I remember when I would try to nurse Noah, I would cry as he would feed. Every position just hurt. Any position that I was in was just beyond painful. I remember one day so clearly walking to the washer and trying to put the clothes into the dryer. It was so painful that I fell on the floor in excruciating pain and I remember crying out to God more times than I would like to admit, please just take me. I am ready to die. I was overwhelmed. I was deeply saddened by the thought of living the rest of my days bearing this kind of pain. Well, upon seeing the doctor, she quickly assessed that I had shattered and broken my tailbone into a lot of pieces. The fall had done major damage to my back, my lower back, and come to find out, she shared with me that falls are the most common injury to new mothers because we're sleep deprived, oftentimes postpartum, and oftentimes carrying little ones, and our feet slip out from under us. I had officially entered that category. I couldn't stand up straight because it was so painful. I lived my life bent over, looking down at the ground or in bed most days. My view of the world became the concrete and dirt. I could no longer look up because of the pain that came with it. So for that season of my life, I settled on the view of the world from the perspective of looking down. It was dreadful and it was so sad. The doctor said that until the tailbone healed itself, that the pain would be intense and unrelenting, and it certainly was. And then she warned me, the scar tissue will come, and that will be with you the rest of your life, causing discomfort and pain always, always to remind me of that dreaded fall. She suggested pain meds, but I wasn't convinced. I didn't want to go down that route. So instead, I went to the chiropractor and would find temporary relief. Shooting pain would be relieved for a few hours, and then it would come back with a vengeance. One day, I was so fed up with it, I shared with him, you bring me temporary relief, but then the pain comes back in a vengeance. And he suggested that I do this. Suzanne, be brave. Be brave and just move. Walk. As hard as it was to not think about lying in bed, I chose to begin to walk. And so I did. And this is where my companionship with God changed. Through miles 
and miles and hours and hours of walking, I could tell slowly I was beginning to get better, to heal. With each step I took, it didn't seem to hurt as badly as it did the step before, and I challenged myself to go further and further every day. I would load my babies up in their stroller. It was a double stroller, and I would push them. And soon I began to realize I was looking up rather than looking down. And I remember so clearly in my spirit the moment when I realized I was no longer hunched over. I was standing up straight, looking up and walking one foot in front of the other. Yes, it was painful. Yes, it was scary. Yes, I was crying out to God every step of the way, but I kept going. I kept moving one foot in front of the other. I didn't stop walking until I did not hurt anymore. And that is when it hit me. With God's help, each step I made, I could tell that healing was occurring. As unexpected as it was, it was happening little by little. Not all at one time, but little by little I could tell that relief was coming. And so I didn't give up. I kept walking. And to this day, as many of you know, I still do. By the grace of God and thousands of miles, my back for the most part has been restored. Yes, I still have pain. And when I begin to feel it coming on, as many of you know, I just get up and I start walking. I move. So when I read this gospel passage this morning, I relate with this unnamed woman. I relate with her in a deep way. Such desperation, such longing hope. I was in incapacitated for a year. She, 18. Almost an entire lifetime for the first century. But in one quiet moment, with a touch of a hand, spared countless miles and miles like what I walked and continue to do. She was healed by a touch, by a man who saw her and wanted better for her. And when he touched her, she stood up straight and she saw the world and the blue of the skies and the green of the trees, no longer the dusty, dirty road. She was free. She was free from the life of looking down. And more than that, she had been touched by the living God, which brought wholeness, relief, and a new life. I remember the first time I woke up and I didn't have pain. What followed was being able to nurse my Noah, who's here this morning and is now 10, without tears in my eyes. When I could take the clothes out of the dryer without having to sit on the ground to do so. When that relief came, a wave of emotion and surprise washed over me. I paid attention, as Mary Oliver says, and I was astonished. I couldn't believe that the intense, horrible pain had ceased, but it did. So this morning, I think of this unnamed woman, and I wonder, how could anyone anyone ever be denied the release of this kind of pain i will say it would be easy to deny someone if you yourself haven't been exposed to this kind of unrelenting hurt it's easy to enforce rules and to lack empathy when pain 
doesn't rule your life. And I'm not just talking about physical pain now. It's easy to be critical when your view of the world isn't just looking down. But I will say, when pain rules you, the only thing you are begging God for is relief. And Jesus knows this, and he offers that relief to this unnamed woman. He saw a need, he met it, even on the Sabbath. But my mind goes to the fact of all days, what better day to create wellness and wholeness than on the Sabbath? The day of rest, the day of completion of wholeness. What a more beautiful way to offer relief. I think Jesus knew that. And so he calls that dumb, evil spirit out of that woman. And the unnamed woman was released of the dreaded, incapacitating spirit that had inhabited her for more than half of her life, which in turn made room for the penetrating spirit of God's love. And guess what? She gets a name. Jesus gives her a name, and he gives her a very special name. He calls her daughter, daughter of Abraham, which is a whole nother sermon unto its own. I don't have time for that this morning, but let me tell you, it is significant. She's given a name. And as a fellow preacher of mine says, the power of this love that Jesus demonstrates turns everything on its head so that the weak are made strong, sinners are forgiven, those deemed untouchable, which this woman was, they are embraced. Those at the margins, which she was, are given a central place at the table. And those who don't deserve to be healed are not only healed, but actually restored to communion. That is what Jesus gives, not just to her, to all of us. So what does this beautiful daughter do? She does something that is extraordinary. Gratitude wells up inside of her, and she responds by praising God. She responds with Eucharist. She responds with thanksgiving. She thanks God. And so what is this inside the crowds? They begin to incite. They begin to praise God. They begin to rejoice. So dear people of God, I will just ask you this one question. What has you so bent over that you can't stand up straight these days? It's different for all of us. But you know what it is. It's right here. I just had to ask the question. You've been thinking of it the whole time I've been speaking. What are you carrying that you need to be released from? What is it? You know what it is. He knows what it is. Be brave. Ask him to release you of it. Cry out to God and ask him, beg him, that you want to stand up straight. You don't want to stoop. You want to look up. Tell him, my God, my God. I am ready to look up. 
I don't want to look down anymore. Hear these words. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.